We're out here tonight. You know what I've been doing today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Lord was faithful and we delivered a, a baby boy, our second boy and fifth child at three this afternoon. Hallelujah. The Lord is so good. He's so kind and faithful to us. He's our Lord and our Savior and he's our friend. I don't know if my wife is going to make it tonight. I don't see her out there. She may not. It was a little difficult of a time uh, or she would be here. You know her. She had a little more time to get here this go around than she did with the last child, and she made it with that one, but she was pretty tired, so I said, stay in bed. We put this on tape anyway. Amen. That's what the tapes are for. Ten-pound boy. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father... This is our prayer tonight, that the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, who is our guide, who is our guide even unto death, that he will minister, he'll take this word, these things of Jesus, he'll minister this word to our hearts, and he won't let us go out of this place without having spoken to us by and through his word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> what a busy week and blessed week that we've had and the upcoming one. I think we've got about four families headed out after the service tonight out of town for some other services, so Lord bless you. We've got some new official scriptural neighbors now who have some land right next to ours. Praise God. That's really good to hear. Lord is good, doesn't want us to be in debt. He wants us to be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. Wants us to have enough to lend to many nations and not have to borrow. Amen. Well, on Wednesday nights, you know, in our weekly studies, we have been looking at a series we entitled a few weeks ago, Overcomers at a Crossroads. Overcomers at a Crossroads. And I want to pick up in that, not necessarily where we left off. I don't know that we left off. I think we finished last time. But we probably finished in a couple of hours. And I don't give you any time limits for tonight. <laughs> Because we've done, tried that little trick before. <laughs> Hoping that psychologically you talk yourself into finishing in 60 minutes or 75 or 92 or 115. It doesn't always work that way. Tonight we're going to teach on how teaching has become the downfall of some in this overcomer's walk. That may sound a little ironic, and I guess it is. It is an irony because that's one thing that maybe the most basic thing that we who call ourselves overcomers, whatever term you want to use, so we don't think we're anything that special. We just think that we're average, normal Christians. I can't think of anything that we're doing that's above the call of duty, according to the Word of God. Jesus said that when you've gone and done all, then you're supposed to still have this attitude, Lord, I'm an unprofitable slave. I've only done what was commanded of me. But we know that in the Word of God, there are different levels of people. There are different levels of growth. The parable of the sower speaks of 30 60 and 100 fold believers and it's not pride uh, it's just our confession that we, we we're going to be we want to be a hundred fold yeah. why confess anything less than that and and call it uh, piety or humility or something we want to go all the way with the Lord we want to be a hundred fold and so I've entitled our study tonight have you grown weary in the well-doing of the word it's from a phrase over in Galatians 6 where Paul encourages us not to grow weary in well-doing because he said that you will faint in due season. I mean, you will reap in due season if you don't faint. Uh, Galatians 6, that's around verse 9. But I'm going to give you tonight one of the basic reasons for some of the problems that have surfaced right now in our own circles. It's not very pretty. 
It's not a, a, a very deeply appreciated truth. Some people may fight you over it, but I think that the facts are clear enough. I think that they're obvious. And I think that uh, we're in a position, having been here a body for 10 years and teaching the Word that whole period of time, to kind of uh, not be a novice or new in this all. We know what it's like to be a local body and to have resident ministry and to have the teaching of the Word coming forth on a regular basis. And we know what a blessing that is. We know that uh, that's a real key in going anywhere in this walk. When you try the hit and miss, or it's also called the, the fly-by-night type approach to learning the Word or to, to ministering or teaching the Word, you don't seem to get very far. And you know, whenever you hear, you hear these crusades out there and someone went into a town and saw 10,000 do this or 2,000 or 400, or, or you hear some word where somebody has... You know, we, we went overseas and we went in this place and the Lord really blessed and the word was ministered and I hear all that when I'm listening and I think, praise the Lord for that. But you know, for someone who's been in this more than six months, it, this just has to be our, our question because, because we know what the word of God has said about matters like that. Praise the Lord for that. But can I go there six months or 12 months from now and still find those people? That's what it's all about. It's not those that start in this race, it's those that finish in this race that are going to make it. And I, I love to hear these things that the Lord really blessed and he reached out and touched this sister and that brother. Praise God, does it last? If, if it's of the Lord, it's going to last. I read in my Bible in, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 that whatever good work Jesus Christ has begun, he is going to finish. And if something isn't finished in some people, I can only guess the Lord hasn't done that work. That's the work of man there. And man's works are going to come tumbling down. What's behind all of this? It's John 8, 31 and 32. Very well-known passages to all of us. It's not those who are in the Word. It's not those who are gleeful over the Word. It's not those who shout about the Word. It's not those who are only first in line for the Word. It's those who continue in it. It's those who continue in this word. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then truly you're my disciples. You're my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We know, friends, I, in my charismatic days before getting into this walk, which there wasn't a big uh, time period between the two, I tried the other way. And you get inspired by messages, and it's fun to go to a new place and a big building and crowds and a new speaker or a well-known speaker or guest speaker or miracle worker or whatever. And you, leave, and you leave that and you go back home and you know what? You have to wake up tomorrow morning. That's the whole thing about these big meetings. You've got to wake up tomorrow morning. Hopefully you've, you've received something the night before that's going to see you through that day and going to see you through that week. What we found in our experience is you have to continue in this word. If you'll continue in this word, before you know it, it's not an overnight, you know, zap, poof, bang, bow, wow type thing where you're just in it all of a sudden and that's it. It's a gradual, it's a gradual thing. You start getting your roots down deep in the word of God. Before you know it, you're being changed. I haven't seen too many one message shots that have changed a person. I'm not trying to do disservice to the word. The word of God's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. But there's something wrong with us, though. We're dull of hearing. We hear that word, we're dull of hearing. I haven't found too many one big powerful messages coming forth, and all of a sudden it just changes a person, and they're never the same after that. We might can think back, now I think I remember a message like that that really changed me. Well, you probably had a lot of uh, background before that message ever came forth. That message was building on something else. It's continuing in that word. You stay in that word, you continue in that word, before you know it, you're set free. There aren't any shortcuts in this walk. It's continuing in the Word. Amos 8, verses 11 and 12, uh, Amos says there'll be a famine in the last days. There certainly was a famine in Amos' day, and it seems as though there's a famine in our day as well. A famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Amos said it's not a famine of bread or of water, it's for hearing the words of the Lord. They'll wander to and fro, north, south, east, west, seek the Word, and they cannot find it. And they cannot find it. Does not Hosea and does not Isaiah both tell us that God's people perish because they don't know enough about the Word? 
Hosea 4, 6, Isaiah 5, 13, God's people perish, they're destroyed for lack of knowledge. So as we started in uh, this uh, a week or so, or I guess it's been a couple of weeks ago, last Wednesday night, the Lord gave us a word about faith. Uh, why is it that uh, after our dear brother Freeman's death that we, we see this race for independence, we see various groups and men getting on a little pony called a hobby horse and riding off into the distant sunset. A lot of confusions and controversy and tangents and rebukes of those who continue to listen to old tapes too much or continue to stay in the word or continue to look back for the old past. Well, that's what Jeremiah 6 says. Ask and seek and return and find those good paths. Walk therein and you'll find rest for your souls. I'm going to stay with the old way because the old way is a proven way. Why give up something when it's working? It'd be another matter if it wasn't working or something. Then we still shouldn't be too hasty on giving it up. We better check out if the problem's with us or with uh, what we've been hearing. What we've been hearing, it may be the word of God. We may have the problem ourselves. I'm not going to be too quick to give up on anything, but especially not whenever it's working. Some of us are here tonight alive and not dead and all these other things because the Word of God has worked for us. It, it is a strong tower for us. We love to see miracles. We see miracles around here, but you see miracles in the context of the Word. Miracles follow the Word. The Word doesn't follow the miracles. I told you before, one time I remember going to a meeting and a preacher up there, well-known, supposed to be a teacher, you know, in this faith camp. Uh, well-known outside our circles but in the broader so-called faith camp and, and he got up there and he knew what people are there for and I know and you ought to know why people are at those big meetings they want to get something from God some you know touch or a feeling something that goes up and down their spine they don't want to bring a notebook and a pen and sit down and copy things down and then go away and say well you know it didn't really it didn't really what you know, it takes years to absorb all of this stuff. And I'm not saying wait forever, get into it now and be zealous. But it takes time to absorb this word and that word changes you. It changes you. Jesus said in John 15, 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You're clean through the word. Not all of them were. John 13, he that uh, is washed needs not to bathe himself, save his feet, and ye are clean, but not all. He knew who was going to betray him. Judas Iscariot, the man from Iscariot, didn't receive the word, so he wasn't cleansed thereby. Jesus is going to cleanse his church, Ephesians 5, before he returns, a part of the church anyway, and he's going to cleanse that part of his church by the washing of water by the word. This man came in, he knew what people were there for, and he brought his Bible in and pinched it up there on the pulpit and took off walking hither and thither. And the people were just excited, never saw him go back to the Bible. I'm not saying that I'm going to, you know, judge everything on whether or not you... But, you know, the, if you're there and you've got an audience of several thousands of people who have paid time and gas and money and expense and so forth, effort to come out there, surely you can give them something that's a little more lasting than a lot of shouting and hollering, which has its place and which is a blessing, something they can take home with them and something that will last and that will endure. You see, we're known in this overcomer's camp for things like the faith message and other things, divine healing. Those are very integral parts, but there's something more basic than that. And it's, it's that which is behind those things, and that is the Word of God. If there's one thing that we are known for, that we should be known for, one great hallmark of this work God has done among the overcomers, it is this deep, thorough teaching of the Word of God that we have received. Now, if that's what has brought us thus far to surrender that spiritual suicide, to go back on this word, to give up the word, to become discouraged or disenchanted over this word, is to commit spiritual suicide when that is what has brought us this far. If we wanted to sum it all up and say, what is the hallmark of, of, that, uh, of this work that has made us what we are? It's the Word of God. It's the deep, regular, thorough teaching of the Word of God. Because it's the deep, thorough teaching of the Word of God that brought us faith and healing and deeper life and everything else. You could pick out those things, or you could go underneath them or behind them and say there's something more basic, and that's the whole Word. It's the Word of God. It's as Paul said in Romans 15, the full gospel. 
It says, as Paul also said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, he said, I've not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Hey, that's what I got when I got in this walk. I had been, I had tasted of some wine from other charismatic ministries. And I was hearing a little bit of truth here, a little bit of truth there, mixed with a little bit of air here and a little bit of deception there. When I got into this walk, I found out what makes it so good and so and so biblical is the Bible. It's biblical. It's based on the Word. It's deep, thorough teaching of the Word. Now, when you lose that, you've lost what, make this, what makes this message and this life so distinctive. You can talk about your faith. There are a lot of other people out there, and you can talk about whatever. A lot of other people talking about that. You can talk about your healing. You can talk about your spiritual charismatic gifts. There are a lot of other groups talking about that. You can talk about right relationships in the home, or the shepherdship people talked about that. And I realize a lot of people also are talking about the Word of God, but they're not doing it. They're not in the Word of God. Man, you say turn to Jonah or Leviticus or Numbers, and they'll say, man, I, you know, I, I didn't come to church. I came to church to be inspired. Church is a place where you get inspired. It's not a place where you're supposed to work. And yet, hey, God tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 that if we want to be approved of God, we better be workmen in the Word. Being in the Word like God wants us to be entails and requires work. He said, exercise or study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. There is a correct division of the Word which results in truth, and there's an incorrect division dividing of the word, which is just dividing it hither and thither and dividing it asunder, according to man's traditions. So, what I want to set forth for you tonight, with this as our background already, as I said in one of the first sentences here in our study tonight, we're going to teach on how teaching has become the downfall of some in this overcomer's walk, that it seems as though in some places both pulpit and pew have grown tired of teaching. They have grown tired of giving forth the word. They have grown tired of receiving the word. That's what we mean by teaching, teaching the word of God. Now, when you go back to the New Testament, you find out that Jesus and Paul, the other apostles, were first and foremost teachers. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we read, and they continued steadfastly. This is the, this is the portrait of, this is a window glance at the early church. Four things characterize them. Acts 2.42, and number one, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Amen. Now, you see, charismatics, it's interesting how the evangelical, non-charismatic scholarly world out there kind of looks down their nose at charismatics, saying they're a real experience-oriented people, and there's a lot of truth in that. They're a real experience-oriented people, and they don't, they're not deep in the Word. They don't get into the Word. There's a lot of truth to that. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because if there's ever been a charismatic church, it was the church of Acts 2 and the church in Jerusalem. They were a spirit-filled charismatic church. And what's the first thing they continued in? Doctrine. That's Acts 2.42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That isn't, that's not the apostles' creed. That's what the apostles taught. Doctrine means teaching. And what did they do with that? John 8.31 again. They continued in it. They continued in it. There's a charismatic group in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost group. They were known for teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers, and so forth. Those are the other three things. But the first thing mentioned there was they stayed with the word. That's always going to be the first thing. That has to, what else could you put? Take that away and tell me something else we could put in this place. I can't think of anything. Not the signs, not the miracles. Those are all blessings. But listen. People simply don't have their eyes open right or they've gotten their eyes clouded over with something to give more importance to miracles and signs than God intends. What do we read back in Deuteronomy chapter 13? If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us follow them, thou shalt not Hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. 
very clear. That was a word to Old Testament Israel in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 3. If there arise a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder and it comes to pass, whereof he said, let's depart from the word. There are various levels and degrees to which one may depart from the word also. You don't have to just go out and out into the world, although that has happened too in our own circles. Can you believe, friends, that there have been people in this walk, now, come on, we're not naive here, are we, that have been in it five, six, seven more years than that, and they said amen, and they took notes, and they, and they, and they were regular, and maybe they were in ministry, and now they're not in this walk anymore. I don't say that with a lot of joy. I don't say it with any joy at all. That saddens my heart. What's going wrong? They're not in this walk anymore. Some are actually out in the world. I could count, first of all, on this hand, then on this hand, then have to start over again the ministers that I know. Some of them you don't, ever, don't even know. I knew them when I lived down south. The ministers who were in this walk, over churches or over groups and meetings, who were not in this walk. They're out collecting garbage. They're not in this walk anymore. They were pastors of churches for 10 years and longer. They're not in this walk anymore. What's the key? It's not those who start well, it's those who finish. Just finish, period. I mean, oh, if God just gave us more people who would finish, you don't have to finish so gloriously. Just get to the end. So many people aren't finishing at all. It's not those who start, it's those who finish. It's not those who start in the Word, it's those who stay in the Word, who continue in the Word. Matthew 24 and verse uh, 13, it's those who endure to the end God's going to save or bless or deliver. In the Old Testament, the priests were not only those who offered sacrifices and stood in that position between the people and their God, but they were teachers. Leviticus 10 tells us that the priests were teachers of the law. 2 Chronicles 15 and verse 3 uh, t speaks of teaching priests. And of course, what were the Old Testament prophet, prophets? Were they uh, soothsayers who looked down ages in advance and saw history, well, they did a little predicting of the future. They were teachers and preachers of the word, basically. You pick up Jeremiah's book, and there's prediction in there. In Jeremiah chapter 30, for instance, there's prediction in there. And, of course, there's more prediction in some, Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, maybe than others. But you pick up any of those, and they're teachers and preachers of the word. I don't know if people don't have a correct concept of what a prophet is, that he's one who just predicts the future and works miracles, but that's not in line with either the Old or the New Testament. They were ministers of the Word of God. Amen. What do we read in Acts 13, the first three verses? But there were certain teachers and prophets in the church in Antioch, two of those being Barnabas and Saul, who were either teachers and or prophets themselves. You've got some teachers, some prophets, or they're all both in that group, and Acts 13, verses 1 to 3. And there, of course, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And they are sent out, and evidently sent out as apostles there. The ministry office of the teacher is given to the church in Ephesians 4, 8 to 11. The teacher happens to be, friends, only the third highest, uh, quote-unquote, if I may, ranking leader in the Christian church, the teacher only happens to the teacher. He is the one who expounds the word. The other ministry offices do that as well. But, I mean, the very name of this office, the teacher, obviously he, that must mean he teaches. He teaches the word. He's only the third highest, quote-unquote, ranking leader in the Christian church. Where is that? That's 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Now God has sent some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that, helps, miracles, governments, diversities of tongues, and so forth. First apostles, secondarily prophets, and thirdly teachers. They have a real important function in God's assembly. Amen. Amen. So what I'm saying is this, that you can, you can date when some people begin to slip or to get off whenever they head in the area of novelties and trivial matters and they depart from just staying with the teaching of the word. They depart from just staying with the teaching of the word. Now, I want to give you a few reasons here, and then we're going to, if we have time, the Lord wills tonight, we're going to get into uh, various solutions that, that uh, people can take. You can take one path or the other, but I want to look at some reasons why people 
have grown weary in the well-doing of the work. Why people have grown weary in the well-doing of the work. You see, we have to have a background like this. We have to have a mind of understanding. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 17, that we shouldn't be unwise, but we should understand what the will of the Lord is. We understand what his will is by understanding what his word teaches us. And people certainly have grown weary in the well-doing of the work. When, I, when I'm using that phrase, I mean that people have grown weary working in the Word because the Word involves work. It'd be a lot more fun to the... I, I would assume this would be true. We're, we're not supposed to be in the flesh, so we're not supposed to be a real authority on this matter. But I would assume that it'd be a lot more fun to spend most of our charismatic Christian life running around to these meetings where we could see some things happen, have a miracle, you know, a number or two done up on our nappy heads, and so we get real excited about what God's doing. You go to a service and you just kind of get uh, whatever chapter of the Bible kind of laid forth for you, and it's just point by point, and you say, hmm, let's see, that's the Word, that's, uh, he must be a teacher, or that man, he's teaching me the Word, and you go home, and then you've got something that you can live and do. How can you live a miracle? How can you keep a miracle? We've got to live the word and keep the word. Here are some reasons I'd like to set forth for you why people have grown weary in the well-doing of the work. Remember this, that if people had not grown weary in the well-doing of the word, we wouldn't have to be teaching this tonight then. It's either true out there or it's not true, one or the other. And all you have to do is look around you and observe with your own spiritual eyes, is this true or is it not, that people have grown weary in the well-doing of the work? I believe that it is true. I, as I say before, I could count on both hands and start over again. Not just the groups, but the ministers who are no longer in this walk. I don't know about all that. I know that God's word is true and God's faithful and I know that if God starts something, God is going to finish it. And I know this, that except the Lord start it, you labor in vain whenever you do it. Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And I know as I've quoted to you before, Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Now then, with that, that's what the Word says. See, we base what we believe on the Word, not on people's experiences, our own included. We base it on the Word. Now, if, if Paul said that if the Lord has begun a good work in you, he'll finish it, he'll complete it in the day of Jesus Christ, then, then what's that say about these people who are in this walk and who've fallen away? Don't interpret the Word in light of their experiences. Interpret their experiences in light of the Word of God. The Bible says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24. He calls you. He's going to do it. Why haven't you and I fallen away from this? Because the Lord has called us to this walk. His grace is around us. His Holy Spirit is abiding in us. And he won't let us fall away. Listen, we don't take that for granted. I mean, we don't, we don't just become real complacent in that, but we're going to start where the Bible starts. Faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. God's not going to let us fall away from it. Hallelujah. That makes you say, well, that seems like that would make you slack off. That makes me love him that much the more because I know how kind he is to me. That he's not going to toy around and play with me and bring me in this for a while and then let me kind of fall away. I'm kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. I'm kept by God's power. See, he's the one that gets all the glory. Amen. It's not of my own works. It's by his own power he's going to keep me in this. That's what the Word of God has to say. Now, you tell me, friends, where, where that leaves these group and groups and where that leaves uh, these people. I wonder, I mean, I more than wonder. I sat under a, a certain man. Uh, I don't guess any of you know him, and I've sat under others that to this day I'm not convinced he was ever really called to be a teacher of the Word of God. That may sound like a real, you know, one of those statements where you risk your neck to say that because it sounds like, well, who do you think you are telling? I'm not doing anything. I'm letting their own life, the results in their own life, be the test. You'll know them by their fruits. I don't have to do anything. Just watch them and see what happens. He's out collecting garbage today. He's not, he did not continue in this work. 
whenever I was under it, I'm not convinced to this day he ever really had a ministry, that God, he had ever really been called. Now, I know that sounds real sad, like, well, how could the Lord ever allow someone to be so deceived? Well, we could, we could ask that question about a whole lot of things. Why did God let the devil sin, and why did God let Adam sin, and why is the world in such a mess? Like, we could ask that question until we just turn blue in the face. We just have to deal with the facts the way that they are and let God deal. Let, we have to judge those within, 1 Corinthians 5. God will judge those without. I'm simply making a comment here. If the Bible says if he's called you, he'll do the work in you, if he's begun a good work in you, he's going to finish it, then hey, you, you, can, you can see, uh, I don't have to fill in the details for you. You know where we are at the end of this day, this little thing that we're on right now. Did God ever start a good work in them? See, that's why we have to be most concerned about our own life. Whenever Paul called those Ephesian elders together in Acts 20 at Miletus there, he said, take heed to yourselves, first of all, and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church with he, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Take heed to yourselves first. I told you back from the very beginning in this ministry, you know who I'm most concerned about in this church? Me. After me comes you. I know that doesn't sound very good, but hey, if I'm a reprobate, then you go with me wherever I go. I'm most concerned about me. Then I'm concerned about you. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Sure it does. Sure it does. And you ought to say the same thing about yourself. You're most of all concerned about you. Today, there's not going to be pastors and, and churches, and we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the things that we've done in our body, whether they be good or bad. And Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. People don't like to talk about an angry God. They don't like to talk about the terror of the Lord. I guess I like to because I guess the Bible talks about things like that. For the continuation. They don't like to talk about an angry God. They don't like to talk about the terror of the Lord. I guess I like to because I guess the Bible talks about things like that. You see, because a person's a minister, I guess because he's a minister, people just think that they're obligated to say, oh, yes, when they get back from that service, yes, they really gave a good teaching. What a wonderful minister, really spoke to my heart. And you know, if all that's true, wonderful, wonderful. But listen, God didn't call us to be dishonest. That's wonderful if he gave a wonderful teaching and it ministered to you and you grew by it, praise God. Then that, that ministry is going, to, is going to bear fruit, it's going to produce fruit. Jesus said, I've ordained you. John 15, 16, that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Personal fruit in your own life and fruit through your testimony and witness and in your ministry. Because someone's a minister, because they say they're a minister, doesn't make us obligated just to agree with them. You'll tell according to the word and the testimony. Isaiah eight twenty. if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. There's no light in them. Well, anyway, that's kind of where I am with what's uh, happened all around us here. I wonder whether or not some of these people have ever really been called to teach or minister. Hallelujah. Well, here are some reasons I said we'd get into why people lose their zeal for the word and they grow weary in the well-doing of the word. First of all, the Bible tells us that due to opposition to the word, you will find people who will simply not make it through to the end. Didn't I say tonight, friends, it's not a very pretty picture? It's not very pretty. But it's the truth. Opposition to the word. This is in the parable of the sower in Matthew 13 and in Mark 4. Didn't Jesus say that when persecution and tribulation ariseth for the word's sake, I mean, he's almost giving personality to the word. For the word, for the sake of the word, for the sake of the word of God. Someone saying, your church is too narrow. Someone saying, that, that minister, that brother, he comes on too strong. Or someone saying about you, just a Christian out there in the body. Well, that, that Christian, that they believe too much about the Bible. When, when tribulation or persecution 
ariseth for the word's sake, by and by they stumble. They're offended. The Greek says sooner or later they stumble. And when you stumble, you fall away. You fall away. That's not a very pretty picture. These aren't things we like to have to hear in one sense, but we have to hear so that we take heed while we stand lest we fall. Persecution. Opposition to the word. The townspeople against you, the authorities against you, the news media comes against you, that is against the work, against the church, or against just this message. You know, whenever we, this church was in another location, we weren't in any formal sense related to what was going on down in Indiana. We were informally related because the Lord had blessed us through the word down there. But whenever all this thing really happened back in the spring of 83 and those reporters from Fort Wayne started doing all this snooping around and gave these big, huge exposés front page and it went New York Times, went all over this country, then we've got people, I mean, who are we in the whole uh, metropolitan area of Minneapolis and St. Paul, of millions of people there, who are we? We were meeting in our home at the time. Church was meeting in our home, little band of disciples, about 11 of us. We don't want to count 12, that might have been a Judas. So we had about 11 of us there. <laughs> well, we had more than 11. I don't know how many we had, but we had more than that. You don't want to count for fear that you'll get discouraged when you find out how few they are. But hey, if we keep producing these children like we've been doing around here, no problem with members. <laughs> Homegrown church is what you call that. That's the old-fashioned kind. Patriarchal kind, book of Genesis kind. <laughs> Somebody had 12 boys back there. I got 10 to go to catch up. Of course, I beat him in daughters. He had one. I've got three. Hallelujah. But here, who are we? And, and so the news media calls us up, wants to interview us. We, well, we hear that persecution for the word. We hadn't done anything. We we're just sitting out there just studying the Bible. That's all we were doing. But because we believe the same word, somebody else believed another state, the news media calls us up. Well, we hear that you're related. And I said, we're not related. Well, can we come do an interview? I said, no. I hung up the phone. I went down to my study, and not a couple hours later, there was a knock on the door, and there those ignoramuses were. I just, can't you understand English? I said, no. They don't take no for an answer. You've got to throw them out. And it was a woman of all people, a black woman who came, and I told her, no, you can't have any interview. And they show up and want to film everybody coming in the church. You know, like, wow, isn't that really something? Man, I bet people on, out there in TV land never seen anybody walk before. <laughs> That's all they got a shot of. We wouldn't let them in. Isn't that real bright to waste people's time and energy and money? We're going to film somebody walking into church. They wouldn't have had to dri drip right way out there in Minnesota. They could have found somebody local near the television station to do all that. But we want to film weird people. <laughs> Well, you're looking around. Do we got two heads growing out or 18 arms or something? I don't see any external discernible way in which we're weird to other people. We want to fear, film some strange people, some weird people. Well, we weren't that work. They meet in a strange place. It's a home. I'm sure she had a home. She lived somewhere. Now, we're not boasting on that, but what church ever gets persecuted by the news media? I mean, if, if they ever did, if these big charismatic ministries out there, somebody started getting on their case, man, they'd start fighting back for all their work. Like what's gone on in the past year or so, and IRS getting after some of these big ministries, and I just hope the Lord closes the IRS, closes all of them down. That'll be good. City of Unbelief, you know, is having to close down because they can't pay all their bills out there. The city that was is a city that isn't anymore. Praise God for that. The audacity of building a medical school for the name of Jesus, for Jesus' sake. Well, you see, you get persecution if you tear that thing down or you preach divine healing. You get persecution then. Now, some of the earlier meetings began with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of acceptance of this word and this message. But again, whenever the walls begin to come down, whenever pers uh, we're assuming it's scriptural persecution. We're not getting into related issues that we could talk about here. We're assuming that it's scriptural persecution. I mean, you could be persecuted because you deserve it. And Peter says in 1 Peter 2, uh, this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when we do wrong, we be buffeted for our faults? If you're buffeted for your faults because you've done wrong, that's not called persecution. 
God is just allowing the world, and sometimes he does, to knock the church over the head a time or two so the church will get a little more spiritual insight and stay right and stay pure. And when they are persecuted, it's either for uh, Matthew 5.10 for righteousness' sake or Matthew 5.11 and 12 for Jesus' sake. If you're not persecuted for the Lord's sake, right, the word, if you're not persecuted for the right reasons, for biblical reasons, that's not persecution. Then. You just made a mistake and you deserve some of the uh, focus that's come down on you. But although people in the churches and although the world out there at large, although they are not spiritually wise, they're not dumb. Whenever you find out, hey, I'm suffering some things and I find out the origin of it, it's the word over here. The world's not dumb. What happens whenever you find out, your brain finds out that what brought that mm, to the tip of your finger is that hot plate or that stove? You're not ignorant. You let go of that. You surrender whatever it is that's causing the pain. You give up. You forsake. You walk away from. You lay down and back off and say, I don't want any more of that. The world's not dumb. The church isn't dumb. Not in this regard. They may not be scripturally wise, but they're not ignorant. It doesn't take too many brains before people find out that, hey, this is what brought me all the trouble. It's the Word of God. I'm staying with the Word, and it's narrow. The Word is narrow. And it's this Word that brought me the trouble, and if I want to get rid of the trouble, well, you have to give up the Word. Or you can stay with the trouble and say, as Paul said in Acts 14, 22, he exhorted the disciples to continue in the faith and that they must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom. Acts 14, 22. He exhorted them that they continue in the faith. And then he reminded them that, hey, <laughs> this faith isn't a bed of roses. We must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom. God's going to allow those things to come to test our metal, friends. He's going to allow that. We wouldn't want him to do it any other way because whenever that, that final day of judgment comes, we'll be exposed as being a fake. Our flaws will be exposed if God doesn't allow us to go through three things right now. Persecution, personal trials, a trial of faith, a trial of healing or whatever. We need to rejoice over that. If it's a temptation, then we pray God deliver us from that. God can't tempt man. He can't be tempted by evil. But he also said in James 1 and verse 2 that whenever you fall into diverse trials, count it all joy. God's testing us now. The trying of your faith might be more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I want my faith tried now, not then. It'll be too late if it's exposed and I'm weighed in the balances like old Belshazzar was in Daniel 5 and I'm found wanting, you know, the meeny, meeny, tekel, ufar, scene message. If I'm, the hand right, if I'm weighed in the balances and found wanting, then it's too late to do anything about it. I can do something about it now if I continue in the Word. Jesus said if you'll continue in this Word, then you'll be my disciples indeed. So you've got persecution. You could have also under opposition to the word personal trials against the minister himself. Person, that's a little bit different. I mean, you might be persecuted just because you are associated with another people, another group, or a whole movement that follows a certain message. And you might suffer a little persecution. Certain places close their doors on you. Back when I first got in the ministry, I traveled everywhere and preached everywhere. And it didn't take too long, and those doors started going click, 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 click. Minister in the full gospel meeting, they said, we're going to have you back next time. Click. I had to wait through an hour of dinner and an hour of a clown show and an hour through a magic show, and by the time everybody was asleep, they said, well, now we're going to have our speaker tonight. So I got up there, and, you know, I'm not one to mince words. I just kind of told them what I thought about everything, and click. <laughs> and then talk for my two hours. I mean, if they're going to take up two, I'm going to take my two. <sighs> People are doing this, you know. When's that guy going to ever get, get through up there? So the more they yawn, the longer I talk. I was, going to, I was going to teach them awake or teach them asleep, one or the other. That's just the way I am. If I see something like that, I just bear down on it then. I'm not going to back off and surrender. That's the devil trying to attack you and shut you up. 
I'm going to either preach them awake or preach them asleep. If they go to sleep, I'll just tiptoe on out and we'll just pretend like that meeting never took place. <laughs> For all practical purposes, it didn't. We didn't get a lot of fruit out of that. Minister in other places. I have, well, you know, some, some of you know I was in a school and I was there teaching on a regular basis and I said something about JDS. This was a JDS school. So I just said something, JDS is a heresy. Whew! First time I ever stood up to teach. You might as well let them know where you stand the first time. That way they can either be glad they hired you or fire you. They said, better not say that anymore. So then pretty soon we said something that women can't teach or they can't pastor. This was a school training women to teach and pastor. <laughs> but you know that old story. They threw me out on my ear in a very non-ceremonial fashion. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So you can have personal trials against the minister himself. What about a minister? I mean, just dream up your own scenario. Who really, you know, let's, let's say physically, a child dies, a spouse dies. I mean, those things shouldn't happen, but let's just say, you know, so something happens. I mean, something, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay with that word? Are you going to try to justify what happened? Are you going to say, God's faithful, we missed it. Or you, you know, you really get in a bind over something and the minister is the one that's not like the church. It's easy when you say, well, the church is suffering something. When it's you, it's your hide being nailed to the wall, as it were. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay with it? When everybody's forsaking, you're going to stay with it? You know, we only have one pattern to follow, and that's our Lord Jesus, and they all forsook him and fled. And yet the writer of Hebrews said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and is set down on the right hand of God Almighty. For the joy that was set before him. That's Hebrews 12. For the joy set before him. He endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and is now set down in the heavenlies. Hallelujah. For the joy that was set before him. He counted that a joy. He knew the way was, as he himself said in John 12, 24, that except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Amen. Jesus died. He brought forth much fruit. We're there. We're here because of that. Hallelujah. I think it's in Isaiah 53, that passage on the atonement of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, where we see that he saw his seed as he was on the cross. And the... Work of the Lord prospered in his hand. He saw his seed. Well, we know what, everything that he did, he did for us. He had no need of that himself. He gave up all of that glory, gave up all of that glory voluntarily. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. He took on him the form of a man and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And what does Paul tell us? Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He endured to the very end. All the disciples, the ones especially who said, we'll never leave you. Though you die, I'll die with you. And Jesus turned and said, oh, Peter, before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me twice. Kind of fast like a jackrabbit on the start, the, at the starting line. How are we when we come to the finish line? I've always said in my life, that's where it counts. And we're all in favor of starting fast. You know, don't start slow. <laughs> Go ahead and start fast. But, you know, once you get the momentum up, just keep on going. Don't, as you get down the road somewhere, say, I think I need a pit stop here. You go in there and the devil will pull the lugs off your tires, what he'll do. <laughs> you better stay out of those pit stops and just keep on going personal trials against the minister. Now, you see, I'm, I'm purposely not being real specific. I've had some rather serious personal trials. We're just going to stay with it. If everybody dies, if I die, I guess I'll just leave my Bible here and my notes here, and, and <laughs> I'm going to stay with it. Amen. Though he slay me, Job 13, 15, I'm going to stay with it. I'm going to maintain my ways before him. I don't care what it costs. Because it only makes sense to me that this is such a tremendous prize we're going to win. Paul said, you know, that they all enter the race and run. He said, so you run to win. Only one receives the prize. I know that it's such a tremendous prize we're going to receive. It wouldn't be worth it if we didn't have to endure something in this life heading toward it. God's blessings are, are not cheap. 
We're, we're in for something tremendous in the future. Why? It's called in Romans 8 the very manifestation. It's the same word as we're studying Sunday mornings in the book of Revelation, apocalypsis. It's the same word, the revelation of the sons of God. God's going to reveal us. He's going to manifest us. He's going to reveal us. Hallelujah. Paul talks in Ephesians chapter 2 how that in the ages to come, that's way past the last period, friends, in the ages to come, he's going to show forth his kindness toward us. I mean, we're going to praise him all the day long in the ages to come because of the kindness that he's had toward us. I mean, I think of these things that most of the world is trying to escape, like having more children. Children are a lot of trouble. Children are a lot of work. There's no question about that. But hey, you know, uh, our parents didn't raise sissies, did they? Aren't we men and women now? You stop thinking those thoughts back when you're 13 and 17 or whenever. You've got a selfish mind that I want me, 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 my, my, my. Children are a lot of work. A lot of blessing too, though. Amen. Hallelujah. They're a lot of blessing. I've got five going on, I don't know, 10, 15, however many the Lord gives. I, I'll take them all. Would a, would a sane person turn down what God says are blessings to us? He said it's a blessing. It's a heritage of God. It's a gift from God. Hallelujah. That's a simple thing right there, and I praise God for that. All these blessed children that he has given me, and this wonderful woman, I, I couldn't have them if I didn't have her. She's the one bearing all these children for me. Praise God. Uh, a good wife is, is something hard to find. If you find one, well, it costs you all of the uh, gold bullion in Fort Knox. The Bible said a virtuous woman, her price is far above rubies. And people are, well, you've heard the old saying, uh, marrying at first sight and divorcing on second thought. Hallelujah. Well, I don't have any, there aren't any, I don't use the word divorce in my life. That doesn't, that doesn't affect me. Hallelujah. We're going to stay the way God says. Well, let's go on. Another reason here, first of all, opposition to the word. I'm just saying that I know situations I could tell you stories about. And you probably do, so no sense in being too specific on tape. Personal trials against the minister himself. And you end up giving up the word. I'm sorry it has to happen. I'm re I really am. I really am. I wish it didn't have to be that way, in one sense. I wish that, you know, God would just somehow uh, keep everybody out there. But it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. You'll know them by their fruit. Secondly, people, we're talking about both pulpit and pew feel like they've already received all that there is to get out of the Word. Now, no one, I guess, would say that. Do you think they would? I doubt it, with their own lips. But I hear statements like this. Oh, we have our notes, and we've got our tapes, and survey classes, and ethics, and theology, and biblical languages, and, you know, now we need to go out and do something about all of that. It's almost like they've got this division in their mind that you take X number of years to become something, then you take X number of years to do something. Where what the Bible says is while you're waiting to do, you're becoming, and while you're becoming, you're doing. When you start doing, you're still becoming. It's all one life together. You don't sit and wait and you don't ever witness, don't ever testify, don't ever manifest a gift until you finally get spiritual enough to, and then you start doing it. As you're preparing, you're doing. And as you're doing, you're preparing. The two go hand in hand, and you always stay that way. Amen. But I hear sometimes, I get the feeling like, we already pretty much know all that there is to know. And I, that only tells me that some people don't really know what's all in this book right here. This book is an inexhaustible mine of truth. Yeah. Things that none of us have even studied yet. Nobody knows everything in this book. Nobody's even had the time yet to study in detail everything in this book and to be blessed by his study in detail of everything in this book. So we got our little class here. We got this class, that class, this work, that work, and, and now we're finished. You don't ever graduate, friends, from God's school of learning. Get rid of that old worldly idea that you go to school for so long you graduate. You don't graduate from God's school. Amen. Give me a chapter and verse for that. The early church continued in the apostles' doctrine. Jesus said, if you graduate from my word, then you'll finally know the truth. That would make sense, you know, if you graduate, then you finally will know. No, he said, if you just keep on keeping on, if you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples, my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. 
You don't graduate from God's school. There's no graduation ceremony here. We finish one study or class the Lord has led us into, and then we just go on to another and build on that. There's so many more topics and things to teach from the Word. And these other things are those things which will further strengthen God's people, will further strengthen God's people and help reaffirm their commitments to earlier truth that they have been taught. I'm always so amazed whenever I see something that I already knew and believed confirmed in some other way or in some other passage of the Word that I'd never seen before. It's just a confirmation of what the Lord had already taught me and done in me and shown me earlier. Now, you see, if I gave up and said, well, now, we've got to graduate and get beyond all this study and get out of the mountaintop, the valleys, the cornfields, or wherever we are, and get out and do something about all of this, that's just like an old carnal attitude of, of getting out under the yoke of Jesus. We've got to stay under this yoke, and it, the yoke is staying under Jesus' work. Then another reason why people have grown weary in well-doing. Now watch out, they're going to get kind of bad on us, I'm afraid. Dissatisfaction among the people, by that I mean they grow bored. It's similar to number two, but I'm just saying something a, a little differently. Some people feel like they've received all there is to get out of the Word. Now let's go and do something about it. The third reason, dissatisfaction over the Word among the people. They grow bored. You know what? This can become a real nightmare for a minister. It can become a real nightmare for a minister. I wonder, friends, how many ministers, charismatic and non, overcomers and Baptists, or you mix them all together, how many ministers have started a work, have been called to a pastor or however they ended up there, call themselves, God called them, somebody called them. You get them there and they're teaching the word. People are excited. It's always this business of people start good and finish terrible. That's always what it is. I mean, you see all the, you see it in the Bible. People start off with a bang and they don't last. Well, Demas was traveling around with Paul. Then Paul, at the very end of his life, said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas traveled around with him. What about that? What about that? Demas traveled around with Paul. You find him in some of the other greetings in Pauline epistles. And at the end, Paul said, Demas loved this world. And you know what John says? If you love this world, the love of the Father is not in you. You don't have eternal life, friends, if you love this world. You don't have eternal life. The love of the Father, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, is not in you. If you love this world, Demas forsook the walk, loved the world, lost any hope of eternal life. Unless there was a 19th Timothy that came later and he got back on the straight and narrow way. By the way, I'm going to go ahead and say it and you can just go ahead and I'll duck behind the pulpit while you take your pot shots at me. Ministers who fall away from this walk don't come back. They just don't come back. Now, if you think you know some exception, then you're probably not talking about what I'm talking about. I mean, Peter, what did Peter do? He denied the Lord. But I mean, that really hurt Peter in his heart. Peter was still there. Peter made a mistake. Peter had a good heart, though. But well, Jesus told us, told Peter what was going to happen in Luke 22. He said, Peter, Satan has desired to have you. That was a personal desire of the devil himself, not a demon, not an arch demon or something of Satan himself. He's desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when you're turned again, then you strengthen your brethren. Peter, I don't call him a falling away minister or one who fell away. I mean, when you fall away, you go back into the world and you just go back into the world. Peter didn't ever go back into the world. He denied the Lord and he knew it was wrong. And all it took was that look. And Jesus looked at him and Peter went out and wept bitterly. Fallen away ministers don't do things like that. They fall away, or fallen away people for that matter. They fall away because this way is too hard. They like to get out there away from the Word. The Word is a searchlight that searches into the innermost recesses. That's Hebrews 4.12. It can divide asunder the, the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's a penetrating work. And it makes you feel guilty, condemned, convicted, whatever, whatever you sit under it. Convicted is the biblical term. You're convicted whenever you sit under this word. 
Let's see, how many holes do I have in the wall behind me after I duck there? Well, just name me somebody in the New Testament. A New Testament, full of the Holy Spirit, minister, who fell away and then came back. I mean, fell away into the world. You just don't come back. Now, if somebody does, I hope they all do. You see, I'm, I'm not saying what I hope is true. I'm saying what I have seen to be true. doesn't mean that I want it to be that way. I'm just saying that's the way that it is. When you fall away, you just don't come back. I haven't found one yet who just fell away into the world, into all types of sin in the world, back into smoking and drinking and doing whatever the world does out there. We're supposed to be innocent and harmless when it comes to evil things like that. In malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. So whatever the world does to have a good time out there, we're children of the light, not of the darkness. We don't enjoy that. We have a spirit in us that convicts us, that, that, that constrains us to love purity, to love pure things, to love the truth, and to love our Lord Jesus. We don't like those things out there. Now, I'm not talking about when someone makes a mistake and they stumble in a moment of weakness or whatever. I'm talking about when you fall away and just go back out into the world. And you come back into this? I haven't seen anybody do it yet. You know what I hope? I hope somebody proves me wrong. I'll be the first to just jump up and down and rejoice. We take no pleasure in the death of the wicked or the righteous or whatever. Because God doesn't. That's in the book of Ezekiel. Well, anyway, back to what I was saying. A dissatisfaction among the people. They grow bored with the word. I said it can become a real nightmare for a minister. I've said people generally do start off well and finish terribly. So what is it about time? I guess time is what it is. There's something about time that, that has a way of, of dulling our zeal, our appreciation, and our hunger. Way at the very end of the first century, the Lord Jesus appeared on Patmos Island to the prophet and apostle John, gave him the revelation of the Lord Jesus. It was Jesus' revelation that he gave through an angel to his slave John to give to us, his other slaves. And the first word that he gave to the first of those seven churches, it was the church at Ephesus, he said, Nevertheless, Revelation 2, 4, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. That's at the very end of the first century. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. You know what we're preaching on all the time around here. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the teachable. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who receive the kingdom of God and receive this message, this whole end time word, as a little child and who continue the rest of their life to receive it as a little child. Because the kingdom of heaven is made up of those type of people. Jesus said in Matthew 18, of such is the kingdom of heaven. It's made up of little children or grown men who have the hearts of little children who love Jesus, who want to serve him, and who don't want to do anything that displeases him. That's what makes up the kingdom. Those are the subjects of the kingdom. We have to stay like a little child. Now, have you ever seen a little child... Oh, open that big box of little goodies. That's what the Word of God is. You know, it's better. It's, it's, it's silver tried uh, seven times in a furnace of earth. It's more precious than gold. It's better than the honey in the honeycomb. Amen. You ever seen a child open up a box and say, oh, junky toys, man, I already got toys. This message will be continued.